Hi, we're now going to talk about five examples of business systems. So systems used in businesses which have a IT theme. Now, uh, SOP, we're going to cover twice. There are two versions of SOP which are very different. In fact, all of these are quite different. Okay, so if you want to cover one in particular or a couple in particular, you can skip ahead. Each one is quite separate. So starting with MIS, we have covered these before really briefly. And MIS stands for Management Information System which is quite vague on what it does. But what it does is it will collect, analyze, store, and present data. Which is pretty much all you can do with data. It does a lot of stuff. The whole point is to give you one system which can do a lot of separate jobs. So the most common example I can think of is one I use all the time. So when I do my registers at school, um, I will do it on a MIS. So my school uses a company called Bromcom and we do registers, we do assessment data, we do detentions, you can look at exam results, you can look at contact details, all the stuff is held on one website. Your school or college will have a similar system um, called an MIS. So not just for schools, other companies will use them, have one system which can do quite a few things. That's the idea. So often there'll be a database for the storing part, um, lots of features built in. So that's the main benefit, right? You can integrate multiple tools. Without the MIS, you'd have to have a separate tool for each of your tasks. But you've got one system, it's really convenient. But because you're combining lots of stuff, this can be complex. You might need to train your staff, you might need to you know, check for inaccurate data. If that first stage collection isn't so good, if you collect inaccurate data, it's gonna affect for later systems. Right, analyzing is looking at the data and making predictions, doing actions based on it. That step is useless if the collection is not good. Certainly with Broncom, I've made many mistakes where I've given you know attentions to the wrong person or um, clicked the wrong thing and it's had knock-on effect because it's all integrated. One small mistake can lead to lots of issues down the line. So that is a slight weakness of these systems. A second example of a system used in businesses are CRM systems. So a CRM system is a customer relationship management system. Now, this phrase is often dropped into many, many uh, pointless paragraphs about companies. It, it's a very sort of general system. But overall, what it will do is collect customer data and analyze it. So focused on customer data, so focused on the data for people buying stuff from you. So like an MIS does more than this usually, but an MIS might have a CRM module built into it. So the two key aims of a CRM is to maintain your current customers, so make sure customers you are shopping with you continue, but also to try and increase your business, you want to try and entice prospective customers. Prospective customers are people who might want to shop with you, but you want to try and make sure they are more loyal or use you more often. So the sort of CRM schemes you might come across are things like the Tesco Club card and other loyalty cards, things like air miles you might have heard of. When you fly lots, you get discounted airplane tickets. Um, you might have seen on YouTube, instead of some adverts, they do, do little surveys. All of these are part of those companies CRM. It's a part of their system to collect data by individuals. Like a club card, for example, at the moment, Tesco are doing a big strategy of reducing lots of prices. Things can be really, really cheap if you've got a club card. And some people are confused as to why things are half price because of a club card. Well, Tesco are doing it so more and more people have club cards and so they can collect and track a lot more data. So it is always a strategy to collect more data so they can analyze it. That's the idea. So maybe Tesco can spot that there is a certain trend going on in under 20s or over 30s, whatever it is, and they can target it with more advertising. That's what the system is about, trying to understand customers' needs and wants, what are they looking for, so we can then adapt our business. But a bit like the MAS, but only really useful if the data quality is high. If the data collected is not very accurate, there's not a lot you can do when you try and analyze it. For instance, these little surveys on YouTube, I personally spend 
half a second reading it and just skip straight ahead or click random boxes. The data collected from me is not very useful to YouTube, I'm afraid. So the data quality is not always perfect. The next system is SOP. And like I said, there are two systems with the same acronym, confusingly. So SOP can stand for sales ordering process. And this constitutes the steps you're taking when a customer makes a purchase. So the sales ordering process are the steps when somebody buys something. So for instance, on Amazon, when you buy something, what is going on behind the scenes? Well, that would be part of Amazon's sales ordering process. Often done nowadays on websites, but equally it could be done over email or in person, or it could be done over a phone call. Now the normal steps will be something like this. It can vary depending on the context, but the general steps are, of course, first of all, the customer places an order. They click the button, they do the phone call, whatever it is. The second step is done from the company's perspective, or the company will process the order. And again, this will depend a lot on what is going on. So it's doing some recognition of what the customer is asking for. This might involve checking payment has been received. It might be checking you've got enough stock or checking that the user is valid or they're over 18 or things like this, right? It could depend on the context. The next step usually is to create a sales order. This is some document or some process detailing what has been purchased, what is the customer asking for, when does it need to be done by, if there is a deadline. And this sales order will be used to fulfill the order. So a person will take the sales order and try and do what it's asking for. So it might be that you have to send the sales order to a particular department. In the case of Amazon, if you get a sales order, I'm sure this gets sent to one of their massive warehouses. It will say what the customer ordered and the person who has to go and collect it will look at the order and go and find that item. So depending on the context, but the sales order is used to fulfill it, to carry out what is asked. And finally, this step may or may not be needed, but especially with big orders, it means we need to send an invoice. An invoice is a document, sometimes asking for payment. You might invoice somebody to ask for payment, but also you might give it as a receipt. So you might send an invoice saying, we've given you this, you paid this amount, um, it's all fine just to confirm it. So it's like a receipt you might get in a shop, an invoice can be sent as a final step. The second version of SOP is completely separate. It can now stand for Standard Operating Procedures. These are not very fun, um, but they are quite important. Standard Operating Procedures are policies giving a set of rules to follow to do particular jobs. So policy is a long document giving you rules. So you might have a company writing these procedures for particular tasks. So you might have a, a SOP for fixing an iPhone or a SOP for installing Linux or a SOP for upgrading the mainframe. The sort of task which has quite a lot of steps involved and things could go wrong. Now these are usually for fairly regular processes and the idea is to ensure consistency across employees. So trying to reduce the risk of somebody making a mistake, somebody not quite understanding or somebody skipping a step. So the idea is if your employees are following this policy exactly, it should reduce the risk of things going wrong. But the problem is people don't generally like rules is one thing, but equally these guides are not always comprehensive. They might not be very clear. To make it really clear will take a lot of time to write these policies. But if it's not comprehensive, that means it's not detailed. It could lead to even more mistakes or it could lead to somebody ignoring it completely because it's missed a step or it's confusing. And certainly they're not very flexible. If something goes wrong, the SOP policy might not be very helpful anymore. Right? If, if one slight step doesn't quite work, you might be as a technician a bit confused as to what to do. Ideally, the staff will be trained enough that they can be flexible and they can understand different issues. Using a very strict set of rules might not be the best. It will definitely limit creativity and innovation. And the final system I want to cover are help desks. Now this is a really generic bit of software which can vary quite a bit. The help desk software is all about supporting 
usually what we'd call technicians working in troubleshooting. So troubleshooting is where you're finding and trying to fix issues. I did say these can vary, but the usual structure is relatively consistent across different systems. So most help desks use what we call a ticketing system. Now the way this works is first of all, the user comes across some issue, you know, their email isn't working, the computer won't turn on, etc., etc. They'll ask for help from a technician and the user will send a ticket. A ticket is a message requesting help. So it'll vary based on the software, but usually it'll give some space to write about what the issue is. You can rate it priority wise if it's really important, you might rate it high priority. Um, you can assign it to an agent maybe, you can target a particular techni technician, um, but it's a message sent to this help desk. The second step would be for the technician to receive this ticket and respond, and of course hopefully fix the issue. The idea is they've got really clear writing about what it is, um, and it's really consistent. When it's resolved, the technician will try and close the ticket. They'll click a button on their page to store the ticket, but send it back to the user saying that it's all been fixed. So it's a way to really confirm things are working now. Now, the point of the system is to be really consistent. If you had a technician getting WhatsApps and emails and phone calls and paper messages left, post-it notes left, asking for help, that can get really confusing. Having one, often a website, with all of these tickets can help the technician organize their work. And also, a key reason is for more senior staff, it allows you to track requests for support. So you've got a nice history of what has been solved, how long it took to get solved as well. And if you've got a busy help desk, lots of issues, different priorities can lead to a queue. So high priorities will get prioritized, they'll go to the front of a queue. Issues which are quite minor will go to the back of a queue. So it can help things when get, things get busy, but also escalation. You might initially try and get a junior technician to try and solve these issues. But if it's a difficult ticket and they can't solve it, they can escalate it. And all that means is they can send it to somebody else, somebody with more expertise, somebody more senior usually who can try and fix it. So in a big system, in a big company, help desks are really organized and ticketing can be really effective. Now, because of that tracking, you can do analysis. So if you are overseeing a big help desk, you can you know, do things like see how long it took, you can see what kind of issues you had, who were the biggest <laughs> problems, who was asking for help for most, and you can try and train them maybe. Is a particular technician not quite working properly? You can do that sort of analysis. The issue is, for individual technicians, it can feel a bit rigid. You're having to follow the system, having to open and close tickets. And you might feel like you're getting monitored. If your boss is constantly chasing you to be quicker or to fix things in a different order, you might feel a bit unhappy about that. But also, it can be a bit of a burden. In many cases, lots of small issues can get fixed really, really quickly. You know, somebody's not plugged in a wire, somebody needs to restart their computer, things which are really, really small. Having to launch a ticket, close a ticket, can waste some time. 